So in this session here, it's called Future of Charging Infrastructure Policy Making and Market Dynamics. And we will hear people, representatives from industry. Uh, we will have Mikael Bayer from E.ON. We will have Jürgen Sinning, who is the regional manager and uh, one of the founders of eways, And Maria Stenström from the, at least in Sweden, very famous 2030 Sekretariatet. And I have no idea how to translate that to Swedish. But we will start with Mikael, uh, which is very appropriate. He's right over there. He is, uh, he's been, he's uh, been the head of business optimization regional grid at Eon Energy Network Sweden for more than four years. And before that, you were head of energy markets for the Nordic region. And prior to that, head of portfolio management. And you are passionate about transformation and electrification, visions of the future and the journey toward them. Motivate, motivate him. And coming from E.ON, grid, energy, and all the issues that have been presented, I mean, particularly maybe in David's presentation, it's easier, it's cheaper to move a warehouse than to build grid to the warehouse. So this is the kind of issues that you work with on a daily basis. So a warm welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's really good to be here. Uh, what a morning. I've learned a lot. So. Uh, We'll try to keep up the momentum. Uh, I promised 15 minutes, so I'll get started. Um, the exponential revolution unleashing a new energy system. I bet you're curious, right? So let's go. Who am I? Uh, my name is Mikael Bayo. I've been, as we heard before, m more or less more of my life I've been doing trading optimization roles in Sweden and in Germany. But the last four years I've been with the EON uh, Swedish grid company in the regional grid. So I'm still a grid beginner, I would say. So who is EON? Um, <coughs> we are a European utility focused on customer solutions and grids. We are 70,000 employees, 50 million customers, and around about a million renewable systems connected to our grid. So it's a big company doing lots of amazing stuff. Today, I'm representing the Swedish grid company. As you can see from the map here, it's situated to the south and to the middle of Sweden. It's about 1,000 employees, 1 million customers. So it's one of the biggest grid companies in Sweden. But I'm actually not here to talk about the Swedish grid. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss it in the Q&A or in the coffee break later, because I probably have a lot of insights we can help you with. But these are some things I want to highlight. We are massively investing in our grid. We're expanding. We are uh, leveling up the whole thing. We're digitalizing everything. So it's investments in the levels you've never seen before. We are, of course, also, we are applying at what we call a connect and manage mindset, which means we realize that we can't, we can connect customers quicker than, than we can actually expand the grid, which is very important if we ever need to expand the grid. And we're also leveling up our analysis capabilities so we can make these detailed grid analysis so we can make the right investment decisions, but also connect customers faster. Everything I'm about to show you today uh, comes from uh, two sites, Rocky Mountain Institute and from an analyst called Nat Bullard. So everything is linked. I highly recommend everyone to deep dive into these sites and read all about them because they are amazing resources. But let's... Uh, Let's unleash this thing. And we're going to widen the scope here a bit, so it's not just about transport. All through history, whenever you choose a new energy source, you had to choose between three perspectives. It's the, this is the well-known energy trilemma. It's cost, it's security, and it's environment. And you can't have all three. You can, uh, we can take an example. We can take lignite, present in, in Europe very much, <coughs> cheap. It's very secure, because you can see it in the ground in front of you, but not very good for the environment, that's what everyone knows. Natural gas or fossil gas is reasonably cheap. It's, uh, everyone thought it was good for the environment, hint, it's not. And, but turns out security supply wasn't that great. You know, all know what happened a couple of years ago with the invasion of Ukraine. But here comes a new, new game, new boy <laughs> in town, a new player, renewable energy, and all of a sudden, 
you have a new energy source which actually solves the energy trilemma. It's the cheapest one you connect to the grid. It's secure because everyone has access to it. And it's much, much, much better for the environment than the fossil fuel alternative. So all over the world, you have abundant, cheap resources that now billions of people are looking to, to make use of and build new businesses and expand. And as this slide states, solar and wind are by definition local. Nobody can cut off the sun. Security of supply, that is a big thing. And this is what happens. You've seen these graphs before, but it's worth highlighting. Wind generation shoots through the roof, growing exponential. Solar, sales of EVs, sales of battery storages. Everything is just going up and up and up. And it's not only a European or North American phenomena. This is happening across the world. Most places, not everywhere, unfortunately, but most places. Here are some examples. Brazil, Vietnam, India, Morocco. Once you get started, it just flies. And why is this happening? Well, as we heard, we heard the term before, something called learning curves, because this is technology. And the more you build from a technology, the cheaper they get. And the cheaper they get, the more you build, and the cycle continues. And this is the learning curves, and they are presumably, extremely persistent over time and a good mesh way to forecast the future as well. You see it for onshore wind, you see it for offshore wind, you see it for solar, you see it definitely we'll see it for batteries. And another way to look at it is this one, which I think is kind of nice. Once an energy source reaches one exajoule, and everyone knows what an exajoule is, right? No? Uh, I had to Google it. It's 277 terawatt hours. Once it reaches that level, uh, Nat here made this graph and said, okay, then it's a mature technology. And how fast does it develop? And here you see solar is by far the fastest one. Beating wind, beating nuclear, beating LNG. It's, it's truly a stellar performance. So, and you look at this, you kind of realize something. Exponential is the new normal. Everything goes really, really fast. So I think the question everyone should ask, if you're an organization, a municipality, a company, an organization, whatever, a region, country, do we go fast or faster? There is no wait and see here. There is no let's see what happens next. If you do that, you're, you're gone. Fast or faster. And if we look at history a while, you see that there are these technological leaps. So this is dating back from to the 1800s. The first two ones, the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Steam and Rail, led by the UK. Then comes the next three ones, Age of Steel and Electricity, Oil and Mass Production, and now the last one, Information Age, all led by the US. The new one, which we can call Renewable Age, is without a doubt led by China. And if you look at different technologies needed to make this transition, and you stack them on top of each other and see, okay, which dominates which technology, you see it's very red, it's very China. China dominates more or less everything needed for the transition. This hasn't happened by chance. This is long-term industrial policy. This is strategic thinking. What comes next? Which sectors do you want to dominate? And China is also a massive fossil fuel importer. Do you want to pay to someone else or pay to yourself? I think that's a question everyone should ask. Unfortunately, the West is slow to wake up. We have woken up now, but we were caught in our short-term thinking, I think. Long-term thinking beats uh, short-term thinking. And this, <clears throat> this is not just policy, papers, and PowerPoint. And I like PowerPoint. Uh, this is happening in the real world. China is leading the, the deployment of wind and solar. They're selling the most EVs. They're electrifying the industry the quickest. And here's another statistic, which I don't think anyone saw coming. Germany, Japan, the biggest car exporters, right? No, not anymore. In just a few years, China has surged past both Japan and Germany to actually be the biggest car exporter there is. And you can, uh, you can realize what is a big chunk of that car export? It's EVs. This has happened in just a couple of years. So do you go fast or faster? There is no waiting. And on today's topic, charging infrastructure, this is becoming a really big mature technology. You look at the biggest charging networks in the world, or at least some of them. You see that the top ones are all China. They're now on the level of, as they say it here, it's Ethiopia. The fourth one, the trailblazer of Tesla, is number four, which is the well-known here. But then it's kind of empty. <laughs> for the rest of us in Europe, 
and not even on the scale. So this is this is big. The good news is that if, if you add all the electrified industry up, you see that already electrified industry or transport has displaced two million barrels of oil per day, which is big. I mean, if we stack up two million barrels of oil out there on the parking lot, that's a lot of oil. And the cool thing is that actually most of it is coming from two and three wheelers. I didn't realize that. Africa, East Asia, wherever. And two million barrels of oil is good, but we're just getting started, right? So this will just grow exponentially. But you can't have a presentation about this without them mentioning batteries. Batteries is, I think, the key player here, as we heard in the presentations before. If we, if, when we come back here in 10 years' time and we look back and say, which technology did we underestimate? I think batteries will be the one we underestimate. That is big. And if we look at prices, they keep falling. 2022 was a blip, but now prices are falling again. CATL, BYD, the biggest battery manufacturers in the world, have all both announced this year that they're going to halve their prices. I'm not sure it's true, but at least it's a strong signal that prices are definitely collapsing. And this is what happens. Battery prices for different sectors have been different, as you all know here, that the highly competitive passenger market, the light blue or green or whatever it is, is dragging down other electric uh, sectors. So once, once battery penetration is high in one sector, it goes to start eating into the next one. And here you see the, the, heavy, the heavy vehicle are coming. You will see it for, for trains, for ships, and for long or short tour aviation as well. It's all coming. And this is what happens. You see on the graph to the, to the far right, you see battery density just keep coming up and up and up. And prices keep coming down, 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 which leads to a higher demand which then feeds back. Then you have more money for R&D, you produce more, prices come down, these to higher demands. So these drivers of change will just strengthen. And if, if, if this one picture I think <laughs> for me was kind of mind blowing, and this is not to bash on nuclear power. If you look at nuclear power, the investment, the capex that goes into nuclear power, the big, you know, nuclear is big, it's big investments, it's big sites, it's complicated. And if you add up all the stationary storage investments last year, Stationary storage, which is not hydro, it's, it's a mostly batteries, is bigger than nuclear. And for me, this is, shows two things. One, the speed. And two, once you aggregate up this new decentralized system, the numbers get big. So here you have to really, you have to follow along here. Do you go faster or faster? Because this is coming in fast. Don't underestimate batteries. And this is kind of the, the boring side of it, but it's kind of what we need to realize that here's, the, uh, here's some analysis on different YouTube channels. People have less and less, they're not, they're not attacking climate change. People are realizing climate change is here. They see the storms and the hurricanes and everything, but they are attacking the solutions to, you've heard it. Heat pumps doesn't work in the cold, right? EVs don't work in the cold. Wind power pollutes plastic. You can't electrify industry because it demands too much electricity, etc., etc., etc. I think you've all, heard, you've all heard the quote: first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And we are on the verge of winning, so keep it up. But this is important because this is in the news now. We have to be there, and tell the real story. And it's not like we're sitting here thinking, okay, there's climate change, we don't know what to do. We have a couple of technologies which are kind of, which we can really put into place. And what are those technologies? Well, it is the renewable energy for the power system. It is electrified transport, a big chunk. It is heat pumps for the heat sector, and it is green gases, hydrogen, etc., for industrial uses. That leaves maybe 20%, which we, we don't really know what to do, but we have a hunch. So why not just do and deploy these? and scale them, scale them, scale them. Don't wait. So, so what you realize is that, I like this quote, better roughly right than precisely wrong. We know we should go here somewhere. There might be speed bumps, but we should definitely not go that way. That way is the status quo, that way is the distraction technology way. Go this way, we have the solutions, we have 80, 90% already, just go. And everywhere across the economy, across societies, this Pandora's box has been opened to say, how do we reduce costs? How do we reduce efficiencies? 
uh, or increase efficiencies? How do we reduce carbon? Where do all the young people go to study? What do they go to the fossil fuel industry? Or do they want to go to developing cool new electric uh, appliances? I'm pretty sure they'll end up in the clean tech world. So this Pandora's box is open, and it's all over the place. And this was started by the climate, but don't don't fool yourself thinking this is a climate issue anymore. Don't get me wrong. I'm 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 happy we're fixing the climate, hopefully. But this, there are other forces at play now. There is, there is competition, there is geopolitics, there is uh, security of supply, there is uh, local jobs, etc. So there are so many more forces now just pushing this forward. So don't, that, don't get caught in the climate streetlight. There's other forces at play. So if I, if I try to summarize this, and I haven't even mentioned AI, which can turbocharge this whole thing, we have the solutions today. So. The problems tomorrow might be some speed bumps we'll get through them. And don't, don't let them stop us. Exponential is the new normal. So do you want to go fast or faster? Don't wait. And you, we, I, we all, we need leaders, right? So be the leader the world needs to actually do this, make this happen. Because we, together, I think it's on us to build that future we expect. And we know where to go. So let's, uh, let's go and do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> that was, wow. All right. Uh, do we have any questions you want gathered? Crystal clear, really. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if, if there's no spontaneous ones? Maybe no. you can wait until the end. If you have other questions, we can yes. wait on after all three speakers. So next, yes. the next. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thank that you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. This was thank fun. You. Yeah. And <coughs> <coughs> all right. Our, our next guest is Jürgen. Uh, now at the right face, Jürgen, are you here? Oh, there you are. Perfect. Okay. I get. Uh, I actually just saw your car. A few years ago. So anyways, uh, I think it's a good uh, idea to network you. So I just followed your car and then I walked up to your office and said hello. That uh, was a good idea. Yeah, and here we are today. And uh, you have been involved with, uh, you work for eWays. Are you actually one of the founders or almost founder, right? I came in as third person. Third person, so that counts as founder at almost, I'd say. Uh, you have built 43,000 charging stations in Sweden. Yeah. So you know quite a bit about power demands. Yeah, yep. yeah, and uh, customer issues. Absolutely, you have an interesting perspective on uh, power level hysteria. I think. Yeah, yeah, and there's uh, constraints. Well, uh, what can I say? You, you uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, you sent me a whole list of great stuff about yourself, and I, I like it all. Uh, <laughs> all of you have gone through the MIT scale up scale training which seems to have been very efficient because you have grown very very fast and you keep growing yep and i'm very curious to hear what you have to say about your experience of yeah so i'm far. glad to be yeah. here thank you thank you for a nice lunch it was excellent um and i want you to to notice the absolute question mark between after faster better stronger because there is a big question mark uh, about this and it's very interesting to hear uh, the norwegian perspective um, on DC charging, I was talking about the power output uh, um, difficulties we have there. Let's discuss that further uh, later today and tomorrow. Um, because in a total, uh, as, as we got to know from E.ON as well, uh, there is a demanding energy market. And uh, how do we scale up this fast? We've done our bit as um, independent, privately owned um, CPO, charging point operator. Um, currently, we have about 43,000 charging points in Sweden, Denmark and Finland, uh, mainly in Sweden. And um, roughly 100 employees at 12 offices around Sweden. Um, and it's been a journey. We've been focusing a lot on AC charging, um, and we've done some DC charging as well for, for distribution and transport companies as well, so we have some learnings from that. But today we're going to talk about the daily charging and, and um, the demanding 
<coughs> challenges we have there. Some of our customers, as you see, a lot of uh, property owners, um, real estate owners, and municipal uh, um, grid owners as well. Uh, for example, here in Lund and in um, both Gothenburg, Yislaved, or Jan Shopping, or where, where are you? So um, they have difficulties, and um, uh, we try to figure out the right way to go. <coughs> As we heard from um, earlier speakers, both Eon and, and uh, the findings from, from UK, um, to get the momentum going. And we've been in, in the management, we've been going um, during a year's time uh, for the Scale Up Academy. And uh, some of you maybe know the Scale Up Academy. Uh, it's um, a methodology um, that was worked out from MIT in Boston, where they looked at uh, what makes Amazon, Google, Uber, etc. What, what makes them get the momentum of growing rapidly in, in the right way. So they focus mainly on these four issues. People get the right team together, uh, strategy of course, um, have a clear, consistent strategy. Um, and, and most importantly, also execution of that. Um, and not forget the cash. You get the, have to have the cash flow to, to get, the, get it going. Um, it sounds very easy, uh, but we talk daily about rocks. Rocks hindering our way of moving in that direction. Um, looking at the strategy um, in the flywheel, um, we say that we have an early market entry. Uh, we do it consistently um, within predominantly AC charging. And so we can serve all customer segments within that, but also add on DC charging. Um, so uh, we have the end to end solutions in, in um, terms of both hardware and software. We have our own uh, CPMS, uh, charge point management system, that we develop ourselves, and we can also include other uh, management systems in, into that. And we can use pretty much any, any, uh, any charging station. Having that daily work, we move into a market in Europe and in Nordics and in Sweden that is very different from market to market. Um, because of policies, mostly, because of the public demand, because of um, people getting the idea of driving electric. Then the European Commission, I mean, they, they made a study last year that concluded if we're going to reach uh, the goal of um, uh, lowering the CO2 emissions, we need to move into electric cars and we, the charge point operators need to deploy roughly 14,000 charge points charging points per week in the whole of Europe. We're doing our bit here in Sweden <laughs> and the Nordics, but it's not easy, really. Um, definitely not. In the long run, uh, we see the traffic volumes are increasing a lot. Um, and how we move and how we transport ourselves and goods and services, it shifts a lot. So for the policymakers out there, um, you need to make the, the words of decarbonization real and look at what kind of inputs and, and, and um, uh, support uh, funding can be handed out to different actors in a timely manner. Because if we're going to reach it, I mean, 2035, 2040, it's soon. We need to act now, as earlier speakers have been talking about as well. We don't have time. And one of the constraints are, of course, the energy distribution. And having uh, customers like uh, grid owners, um, it's difficult uh, to, to um, work in this transition. And our daily thesis is that faster is not always better in terms of charging. You have to analyze, and that's why it's interesting to look at Norway. Um, they have the power, pretty much ready, pretty close at least. We don't have the power output everywhere in Sweden, uh, especially down here in Skåne, where we live. 
so how 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 do how do we change people in in how they should charge etc so there's a perceived uh, need for dc charging and i want to challenge that every day and perceived need of uh, pretty fast charging even if it's 22 kilowatts in in a um, in the multifamily housing. Why should you have 22 kilowatts in a multifamily housing? You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to be there for 10, 12 hours. Slow, uh, slow charge. Very, very important in a collective manner where thousands of people, millions soon, are going to charge at the same time when they get home from work or during night. So um, we need to expand that knowledge and experience uh, th through across a lot of um, um, uh, receivers. Um, looking at the studies, how far do we drive as a private person per day? I mean, it's not more than 30, 40 kilometers. Remember that and have that as a state for your daily charging needs. Uh, but then again, I mean, once, twice, the three times per year, you're going to visit uh, to go skiing or you're going to visit grandma, etc. Of course, very good with the DC charging. And, and, um, but it also comes down to what kind of car or transport mode you're going to use. There is not always a need for a big battery car. And that makes sense in a sustainable manner as well. Looking at the output, um, how far do you come? Some of you, m maybe most of you, know this already. I mean, if you charge with the three-phase 16 amps, you charge roughly about 50 kilometers per charging hour. That's nice. But if, if you're going to be at home eating, sleeping for 10, 12 hours, I mean, why charge 11 kilowatt speed? There's no need. Slow it down. And soon, at least in Sweden, we're going to um, get to know the fantastic power tariffs. Uh, that's why they change all the meters in our houses. It's going to be hourly, and you're going to be um, uh, you're going to pay for for the tops for the p uh, spikes you create every month. So, in 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 all, it needs to be a behavioral change. I used to say uh, that, I mean, charge when stopping, even if it's at home or at the gym or shopping, charge when stopping. Uh, don't stop to charge. Your daily charging. Very important for our collective grid because it won't be able to take it otherwise. And of course, I mean, load balancing was pretty new six, seven years ago. Now everybody ha uses a load balancing uh, locally in your, in your house or in your summer place. And the grid stability. I mean, uh, let's talk to Ian in, in, the, <laughs> in the breaks <laughs> and see. Because he's right. It's, it's, it's a big, big change. And the smaller grid owners have big tasks. So what do we have? waiting in the future bigger cars bigger batteries faster charging crazy to me and this is i mean what mckinsey expect i mean today we're at about 150 kilowatts for a normal uh, battery electric vehicle and that's the standard but but when you're up to four five hundred kilowatt charging why in a person in a small car crazy but then again i mean some some like it looking at these dc charging hubs um the all the manufacturers are trying to get attention from tesla and then that's what you see most often it's crazy the most crazy part uh, picture is this where they put up in Manhattan a subterranean garage, 500 kilowatt chargers. Why? So it's a big point to question that speed. Um, instead, use the, that power, put up more chargers. So how, how does it look on a, on a bigger scale for uh, the demand for um, power? 
today, I mean, it all, all the curves are, are, are uh, that we've seen here up till today. Um, at this moment today, we've seen the curves uh, up, up, up. Uh, quite interesting. The number of EV charges and how much will uh, energy will they consume and power? Well, they reckon that it's not more than roughly five percent of the energy demand in 2030, and it's divided into these slow or normal uh, private homes, faster or um, even super fast chargers. That's the prediction around uh, the coming 15 years. Um, but not if you put up 500 kilowatt chargers in the, in the garage. <laughs> so for the grid owners, it has a lot to do with managing the, the energy demand, of course, the power uh, output to have a flexible market. Um, and today, um, the honey jar is uh, storage, of course, as, as, as the earlier speaker mentioned, storage in batteries predominantly, um, and also the power output, I would say, is, are the two most important things to, to l keep an eye on for the future. Because then you can manage the power output in a more um, reasonable way. Bidirectional charge. EV charging and all the millions of cars with great batteries will have will be become a, a great source to manage. Um, so I mean, looking at 10, 20 years ahead. My guess is that all the containers with batteries that we sought, uh, that that we seek uh, now and want to deploy everywhere, uh, they're going to be um, paddle courts in 20 years' time. We're going to use the cars to manage and balance the system, but it demands flexible cars and flexible charging stations. It's not easy. But it's f food for thought. And we'll have some questions, maybe. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jakob. Uh, I um, if we look ahead, what will be the charging infrastructure and what will it look like that enables the last 25% of vehicles to go electric? I would say affordable small cars with small batteries. If you look at the private persons, uh, I mean private cars, if, if that's what you, or, or that's predominantly in, in my head, but the topic today is also transportation, of course, but um, cheap, uh, small uh, battery driven cars. Uh, they could be retrofitted. That's the latest from Transport Environment and European uh, Commission um, um, uh, suggestions. Uh, but especially the small, smaller batteries. You, you don't need a bigger battery, um, maybe 300 days per, per year. Uh, it's those other days you need a bigger battery, perhaps. So that could, uh, and, and that's the, the um, what, what, we see ahead smaller cars with smaller batteries. And will they be charged in the same way as the infrastructure we built today? I hope they will be charged. Or will uh, you have an slowly. issue scaling this up? Like th the way we build charging infrastructure today, does it scale all the way? Yeah. Um, I mean, focus, I mean, as we have seen in Norway, it's the same in Sweden. 90% of all charging is done uh, uh, at home or at work. It's going to be the same. Uh, Definitely, but then it's going to be convenience with with the DC charging at gas stations or former gas stations. Thank you, uh, Sophie Marie. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Jürgen, for the very interesting talk. I was wondering, you were touching upon the fact that you know we want to fast 
charge faster. We want to have, um, you know, big battery electric vehicles going 800 kilometers, maybe soon a thousand kilometers. Do you feel like regulatory measures or even behavioral interventions are needed in order to stop this craze? And if so, do you have an idea about what could be a first step? I mean, government interventions, uh, most of us don't like it, but, but it could be a tax or something, but, but still, I mean, let's put the focus, energy and, and um, mindset on getting everybody to drive electric. Not to punish those, the, the ones that have big battery cars. But we see in Europe that the SUVs are being um, hit um, by suggested higher taxes. Uh, the big SUV uh, BEVs are uh, being suggested with higher taxes. Et cetera. So it's, it's, it's going in that direction, yes. And might be good. It's a political subjective thought, yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Maria Stenström from 2030 Secretariat. It is 2030 Secretariat. It's just very difficult to. Can, you have to explain a little bit in English. How, how do you even translate it? No, but. Right, but you're a think tank. Maria, uh, Maria is a humanistic systems focused civil engineer with more than 20 years of experience in change work in the energy and transport sectors. She has founded Fordon Gas, Sverige AB, Pioneer Renewable Fuel. You were CEO of Gothenburg's Cities Parking Company, where you pushed through a series of crucial sustainability initiatives that developed the traditional parking company into an innovative mobility player with travelers' needs in focus. And uh, she works closely with Matthias Goldman that a lot of people know about, and Agnes Bondelid. And uh, you work to reduce the transport sector's emissions. And I'm very curious to hear what you have to say because you have like a wide perspective and experience from real down-to-earth municipal work. So please welcome Maria. So. Uh. I hope I can add some new thoughts or perspective in what I aim to say. And I would start with that we are here, what we are here for is not a Swedish <laughs> issue. It's about the Paris Agreement from 2016, I think. It's about e e EU being the first climate neutral region in 2050. And it is, of course, about the Swedish law, the climate law that says that we should be net zero uh, at 2045. And in this law, we have one sector that we have focus on, and that is the transport sector, that should reduce its emissions by 70% till 2030. And we had an wide agreement about this, seven of eight parties is behind, and with a, a new TDE agreement, we even have eight parties standing behind it. And this is the law, even whatever you hear in the media. So, how do we do to help Sweden to reduce its uh, the emissions from the transport sector. I think it's important to work with three Bs. It's the bilen, bränslet and the beteendet. And bilen says that we need to work with all transports, domestic transport, uh, different transport issues, as well on asphalt as on rail, in sea and in air, and even the non 
the non or the active mobility. And it's the bränslet, the fuel, it's all non-fossil solutions, including the electrification. And the last one, the behavioral change, the, the one that is um, where it's happened the least uh, back. And we have a potential there. And that's what I will focus on. And that's about how using changing um, the need of energy, transport, or working smarter. And we do this by uh, a support from the industry that are financing us, and they are uh, representatives from the three Bs, Bränslen, Bilen, Beteendet. And this is important because these partners of us, the Coalition of the Willing, they see the future business in doing this. And it's not only about the climate, it's about the future, being in fr a front runner of the new green business. And I think you are here because you know that Karin and Elon wrote. It's not that Sweden has the most impact on reducing uh, the uh, emissions. It's by finding the solutions that we can gain on, our industry can gain doing great green business in the future, inspire other countries to use the new initiatives, the new ideas that we find by being a front runner. And that is important to not slow down the curiosity of finding new solutions. So how are we, sorry, oh, and um, I changed the, the orders of the pictures. Um, we are also, the climate law is backed by uh, um, all sectors, all industries, and we have 22 roadmaps for different sectors. But this is also a way of continuing planning, thinking in silos. We need the more cross-functional system thinking for solving this complex future that we need to solve. And how are we doing? <laughs> the, the green line is if we should have a steady pace towards the 2030 target, and the blue one is the uh, outcoming from how we are doing it. And as you can see, we followed the pace in the beginning, but we are doing it too slow. And we have reduced our emission by introducing more efficient vehicles and a lot of biofuel in the re reduction quota. But back to going from the silos, we need to understand that the, it's not about the transport sector. It depends on how the other sectors are doing. And the blue one is the transport sector. And as you can see, that's the one who is decreasing the least. And everyone in these sectors are seeking for the same solution. It's more electrification. It's more biofuel, fu renewable fuels. It's more efficiency actions. And if you put them together, <laughs> which no one has yet, you would see that that will be the complexity. You can't plan in silos. So it's also that every part in the energy sector affects each other. So. Uh, the transformation uh, in the transport sector affects the electricity market, the biofuel market, the heat market. There is a connection between them. And if you have a sectorial goal, it also increases or decreases the, um, the space in other sectors. And there is a need to be more, 
have more a system perspective and a cooperation between or across all these sector borders. And that is, and it's not only about Sweden, I should say, too, because the energy market is integrated in the European market. So it's more complex than we usually plan for. And that is why we need to modulate uh, the transport sector, forecast the transport sector integrated in the energy sector, in the European energy sector. And this is what we do. Um, and upon the demand and supply in these sectors, we add political, the EU poli politician decisions and the Swedish. And this is the scenarios we had two years ago. And as you can see, the black and gray uh, areas is the fossil fuels demand. And the green one is renewable, and the yellow and uh, whatever that, orange, is some kind of electrification. And the results from that, this mod modeling two years ago said that we could reach the target for 2030 with a lot of use of renewable fuels because the electrifications haven't shown, the effects of the electrifications hasn't been shown up yet by 2030, even though it's a high pace of electrification. New government, new political <laughs> decisions, or more, uh, uh, as you say in Sweden, halv halt. Wait and see, we need to investigate more. And that is caused, and the result of that is that we are now increasing our emissions. And of course, it's interesting to do a new modeling scenario. Very interesting. And the result is very, very <laughs> dependent on fossil fuels. And I would say that is a risk. You, Michael, told us about other perspectives of what this uh, forecast are saying. And we won't reach the target to 2030. We will reach it to if we have this as a target. And a lot, still a lot of fossil fuels. We are making the wrong persons, the wrong countries richer. And it's, I think you said it, Michael, it's better to keep the money inside <laughs> our country and our industries. So, what's the solution? You don't need to redo everything. Do it right instead. Use the tools that worked. Scale up, of course, the electrification, but don't wait. I must find my... Um, the new politicians has made it cheaper to use fossil fuels. It had reduced the reduction quota and you saw the results. Um, and the new politicians is focusing more in one solution, and that is el the electrification. And this is a picture you, I've seen. You've seen it from some of the other uh, speakers. This is the uh, sh market share of new sales. The red one. It's about. It's. It's uh, from. 2021, it's, it's over, it was over 50%, and that's a high leverage. But the share on the market um, is low. We have 5 million f uh, combustion uh, vehicles, and by f with a high electrification pace, we will have about 1 million electrificated vehicles in 2030. We still have 4 million combustions with 
fossil fuels if we don't do something with that elephant in the room. We must face the real fact and not just look at the new sales share. That's, that's, one, um, that's one part of it. And we can't pit different solutions against each other. We must focus on the red one, which is, should be gray, fossil fuel. And you see the share of non-renewable energy. It's this a lot of <laughs> work to do. It's a lot of business to do here. Focus on reducing the fossil fuel, not only electrification. So it's not about the target. It's about how much CO2 we are, that are, is accumulated cum, in, um, in the air or in the atmosphere. And this is what happens if we don't use all the tools, all the solutions. And if we won't have the heated scenario that has a um, heat more than two degrees, as the Paris Agreement says, we shouldn't have. This is not the way of doing it. It's the, the, the accumulated amount of CO2 that is the problem. So it, the, the, it's not the target we should focus on only but this picture. So what do we need to do? We have to level up the system thinking, focus on reducing needs, work harder, work smarter, find new solutions. How can we reduce the, the demand of energy, the demand of transportation, the demand of goods or freights? We need to think bigger, smarter, and co-create cross-border the different sectors in a much faster way or natural way than we do today. And it's time to rethink the car. Is the car a need or is it a behavior? What is the need? Is it to have a car? Is it to go one person in a car? This is the mind shift that we need to have. And the shift is to focus not on the behavior, but the need. Because we can't fix or uh, trim the, the solutions, do them better than we have. We need to focus on how can we um, uh, supply the need in a more sustainable way? Or could we even work more upstream by changing the need, by planning our cities in another way? This is the big new thing of reducing the need of energy transports in the future. And one way of doing this is call for a more multimodality transport system. You, don't, you are not a car driver only. You take the train, you take the bicycle. Uh, you don't take the goods from China by train all the way. But we still plan each transport system in a silo. We must become more of a system thinker, system planner, and system cooperator. And that is as well as it's not about Sweden, <laughs> because we are the cross-border transports. But we still plan national. And we have something coming when the Freeman Belt is opening, that we haven't cooperate cross-border enough. And 
stop thinking that we are competitors. We are cooperators. Steal with pride what's working in other areas. Accept that we are going into a totally new ecosystem where you're not just a consumer, you could be a supplier. There is new rules, there are new um, um, need of business models, there is new way of co-creating the future. And as you said, we can create the future we want or expect if we find a new way of working cross-functional together and don't compete in. Uh, there is a, not share, a market share for this business in Sweden to expand in the future. So my conclusion is, for making a deep impact, we must challenge what it is. It's not about the target 2030, it's about the amount of CO2 that we need to reduce. We must make it by um, political decisions or policy changing to make it easier to do the right thing. It can't be more cost effective to use fossil fuels. And we need to create that creates value, value for your business, value for Sweden. Uh, and as someone said, stop, we can't think how to do this. We must start acting and start finding new ways by the way we find new solutions, new hinders, and so on. So, do we do this? It's a, not a single race, it's a together race for the future. And I think if we do this, we can all be winners. And this will, could we do this? This is an opportunity for Sweden to be great again. Thank you. Yes, I have a question here from Andreas. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about the calculation for the CO2 emissions. Are they calculated on a global well-to-wheel or locally emission for the bio-blending? Locally. Yeah, because sometimes it's uh, more CO2 emissions from transporting here to blending it here to just get a local CO2 lowering emissions instead of using it where it's more needed if we look at the global lowering perspective. And folk, it would be better to focus on uh, developing uh, uh, the technology here to be able to export it to the other countries for them to follow us instead of focus on the little one for the local lowering that when we actually are letting out more globally, which is counterproductive in, in a global way. Um, and also, for example, like now we are, even with, when the, we had the bio-blending, uh, it was actually more expensive for us to go with electric vehicles uh, within Sweden with our trucks than it was for us to go with diesel even before the new uh, TIDA party, parties went into action. So what I'm thinking is, isn't it better to not, not better, but is it not uh, good to actually focus on the technologies uh, and expand them more uh, and be able to export them rather than uh, punishing in the, in the short run and be better in the long run and looking globally? Of course, you shouldn't punish anyone who does the right thing, yes. uh, and that is a political decision. But uh, the scenarios and those who are, we have cooperated in doing this is to start um, start uh, growing an inner uh, market or demand for renewables so that we could start being producer uh, in um, produce the, uh, the fuels in Sweden because it's a risk exporting both fossil and renewable yeah, fuels. Course, we course. need to be more independent. So that was, of course, one uh, question that the modeling or the different scenarios yeah. should answer. Yeah. 
Yeah, if that was what yeah, you... Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. Yeah. To and, and of do course, that. you should do the scope three or four to see the real emissions. Because um, we usually use a very bad or old emission um, equipment uh, where they produce lots of the biofuels and it would be quite a lot of impact of using it locally and then focus on the electric transportation back home and maybe lowering the cost for the electric transportation at home uh, rather than just looking at the point CO2 emission here then let them use but the we have biofuel. fantastic industries since yeah, yeah, that we are have, just we waiting for <laughs> producing them yeah here okay <laughs> well thank you thank you so much No, I mean, uh, we've had some insights, uh, and you're a proponent of biofuels and local production. Of I, I, um, I like and everything that solves the bigger question, yes. the CO2 emission. Right. And we can't only focus on one solution. We need all these, the palette of different solutions. And the biofuel would be a parenthesis mm -hmm. until we have electrified more of the transport sector. But we oh. need it now. Yeah, well, I agree. And I, I mean, there's no point in putting a heavy battery in, a, in an aeroplane. No. You know, unless it's going to go just do a little short hop. You know. Yeah. Yes, you had a new custom coming. No. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 we are a little okay. bit ahead of time, which mm. is great. And Depending on the number of questions, we could take questions to all the three speakers who have been up right now. That's fine. If you're still here, do we have Michael here? Jürgen? There is. I have not made a list of questions, so I'm really depending on the curiosity of the audience. There is. Can you, just a second. Johan? We have a question back there. Please come up, all three of you. Thank you. Um, Maria, I actually have a question for you. Um, so you said um, that the goals don't matter that much, but um, at least I'm a lawyer. So um, in Germany, we, had, we also have a climate law. Um, and in 2021, our um, constitutional court said, uh, you have a great law here, but you, you don't have any goal for 2040. So you have to have goals in between. Does the Swedish um, climate law doesn't have in between goals? So this is why you have, uh, uh, according to your new analysis, such a gap between 2035 and 2040, which is kind of ridiculously big. <laughs> we have goals for the whole nation, but we have this 23rd goal for the transport sector. And when I said the goal isn't important, that's a lie, because it's important, but it's not it's bet it's not if we reach the the, the target uh, with doing everything the last years and have have all this co2 in the atmosphere then the, then we didn't work it use the uh, target in the right way and so the the swedish um, climate law still has like targets for each sector no only the transport oh. sector Ah, only, only the transport sector. That's unique. Yeah. Um, yeah. So because now our government wants to, um, like, we have sect goals for each sector still, but they want to change it now. So we don't have any goals for, like, we only have one goal for all sectors, basically. So yeah. we're probably going to end up in a situation like this, where, like, five, five years before, before 2040 or something, we're going to be like, oops, <laughs> well, now we have to reduce like hell. <laughs> How are we going to do this? So... Um, yeah, that was very interesting. I think it's uh, important with sectorial goals, but <laughs> we too. have this in the transport sector because that's is the sector is, is lagging. I know it's the same in Germany. It's it's very terrible. Thank you very much. Yeah, to it, the question is to you, Michael. Uh, very inspiring presentation. I feel the acceleration when I'm listening to <laughs> everything goes faster, <laughs> even faster. And then in the end, you left a cliffhanger on AI, and it's dawning on me, and I guess on many others in this room, that that, that will make things go even faster. 
Can you speculate a little bit about what you see when you think of AI and all these transitions of energy and transport that we have talked about so far? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> the way I think about it is AI will increase power demand, which is not a good thing, but that's just the way it is. But um, I think we can use that technology to come up with new solutions, new battery chemistries, new grid simulation tools, whatever, all that stuff, new biofuel blends, all that stuff. I, th I think in actually turbocharge technological development, so we can go even faster. I think that's where the real, um, the big upside is on AI for, for energy, that we can do, building that grid of the future where all these million assets are intertwined, they're all optimizing everything like you were, that demands a lot of ca calculation capabilities and good algorithms. I think AI can help us there as well. So I think, I think it will be a good tool if, if we use it right uh, going forward, which can increase the speed. But I think definitely in, in hardcore stuff like material sciences and stuff like that, that's where we can see uh, an acceleration. Could I say something? <laughs> I think we are, it, it could be that we are uh, doing the inf um, infrastructure for charging based on old demands, old behavior. When we have a more automotive fleet or when we start, it's when we start changing the chauffeurs or the batteries instead of charging and resting have we placed them in the right place then? And I think AI could be a, something uh, doing new scenarios. Now we're building the infrastructure on the behavior we have today that was caused on Arbetsmiljölagen. <laughs> um, you know. Yes, thank you. I have a question from David here. Thank you all very much for great presentations. Michael, one for you again, terrific uh, presentation, thank you. Thank you. You said better roughly right than precisely wrong. Yeah. And I, I do agree with you uh, on that, but I wonder how you would characterize a roughly right solution. And the second part of it would be, doesn't roughly right solutions open a gap where bad actors can cause delay? That's a big one. Um, I, if I'm being simplistic, I think the, the roughly right solution is the one based on on renewable energy, on electrification, all that stuff. Because uh, I think the problem, I mean, you can have the examples of which countries can integrate solar and wind to which percentage. And people are sitting here looking at, but there might be a problem when we reach 80%, or whatever, 90%, or even 70%. But why stop now? Because we will. Don't, I'm pretty sure that will be speed bumps when we get there. So I think the roughly right solution is actually following in this path: the green path, the electrified path, the battery path, etc. And, and and releasing all that innovation that comes with that. And I'm pretty sure all the students at at the university are, they're looking for this. How can we do this? This is where the fun is. This is where it happens. Um, and it, of course, it opens up to bad actors. But I'm kind of coming, coming, coming from the view that people want to do good, and if people want to do bad stuff, we have to handle those as well. And we have a huge industry already now that are kind of doing everything they can to delay, delay the transition. Well, yeah. If you say, here's roughly the solution, the, the bad actors that, that want to cause delay, they will say, well, look, I need much better numbers on that. You have to be precise about this. And that solution, you know, you know, it doesn't work in winter. Uh, it doesn't, heat pumps don't work when it's cold yeah. and EVs don't work when it's yeah. cold. I mean, not not if the you UK have, at least. Yeah. No. <laughs> so if you have partial solution or a rough, yeah, roughly right. solution, or you get this policy we just heard in Germany, right? The, the policy is all sectors have to reach net zero together. Well, what that means is aviation and shipping, the really hard yeah. to deal with ones, they now say, we have to have a solution, you know, really important that we have a solution. Each one or two percent of the total problem, very small part of the problem. And you, you, you then get spiral into having to solve that particular yeah. detailed problem instead of the big 
big problem which you can solve by roughly the right solution. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I agree. That's a delay tactic, and that's why we need these intermediate goals because then there is no other technologies that can be used. I mean, if you want to get rid of UK gas boilers, then you just could install heat pumps, and you could you can do that very KPI like. And I think we need those as well. That's why what you said is the end goal is important, but the road there is even more important because then you can get away with these delay tactics. Um, so I think you need those intermediate, but we have to watch out for people who want to, I mean, they're in there with their money delaying policy. And I think it's dangerous because uh, there's a lot of money that will be just go away all of a sudden. It's a big trillion dollar industry that will just disappear or most of it will disappear, which is change is hard for some. Exactly. Yeah. So there's new, new power, power. A new power paradigm will open up, and the, and the new players, not the old players. So that that's a it's a rough transition, but we have to be in there. We have to go roughly right. Thank you. No, uh, short no, one. Just you, you, another question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. For, for you again. Um, you spoke about rocks earlier, and uh, what are the biggest rocks right now for for uh, uh, getting more charges and more charging out there? In general, uh, I would say it's absolutely uh, the grid connections um, and the price to get those grid connections in Sweden, if we talk about Sweden and especially southern part of Sweden. <laughs> That's a big, big rock. Yes. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, and I mean, ev even we, we've done a lot of calculations. I mean, uh, putting up a DC charger, um, there has to be minimum of four to get subsidies. And if you get the subsidies even in 10 years, it's difficult to, to get the calculation yes. profitable. And I guess if you would have megawatt uh, heavy vehicles charging all at the same time, that would be yeah. even more expensive, I guess. Of course, yeah. of course. But but mm. then again, I mean, batteries uh, and storage uh, could be a solution for that, absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. I mean, we'll I'm taking a few notes here. We'll fix here. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You'll fix that for yeah. him. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, to summarize, I mean, we, we haven't spoken much about behavior. Thank you, Maria, for bringing that up. Uh, that sort of, it feels, spills back and forth. This, because I know from our, you know, from our years of working with charging infrastructure and technology that our experience from the OEMs, the big you know, truck manufacturers, are that they actually are expecting things to work as with a diesel truck. You know, you stop, you charge, and you're, you know, instead of filling up, uh, which creates a lot of problems. And that's what you are addressing, you're addressing, you're addressing. Uh, I also see an opportunity for a new industry that has hasn't really blossomed yet. We, you know, companies that retrofit old vehicles because we are not going to make it unless we start rebuilding old petrol and diesel engines. Uh, and what else? Also, maybe not so much this session, but the one before. I mean, the 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 the, the people that keep all the companies or the industry that keep things back. You mentioned carbon capture storage, which I, you know, people started talking about 20 years ago or something like that. And it's not, you know, what the biggest one is maybe on Iceland and it's captured one ton in two years or something. It's ridiculous. You just don't cut down a couple of trees and you achieve the same effect. Uh, and the same with, with, uh, with hydrogen, there really is no green hydrogen. The only hydrogen we have is a byproduct from other productions, and it's also needed in oil production. So I'd say both of them boiled by down back to the oil industry, where which we are still super dependent on. I mean, I, I know that we, for each tomato I think we eat, one tablespoon of oil is needed for each tomato. And if we look at the whole sort of system of agriculture, transport, etc. It's something along those lines. And it's kind of ridiculous. We need oil for everything. So we need to do what we can, where we can, and look at the bigger picture. It's the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that counts. Um, I want to thank you all for your contributions. Thank you, thank you. very much, thank you. all three of you. Welcome back. Hope you got some nice refreshments outside and some good conversations. 
our next speaker is Karin Ebbinghaus, the CEO of Elon Road. She actually has a background in law. So she's been in corporate law for about 17 years, I think it was, yeah, ish. Um, and she has a soft spot for transportation and startups. And when she was working as an investment partner for uh, car CO2 reduction companies, she stumbled upon Elon Road and uh, sort of wanted to invest in them and thought she could invest herself in, in Elon Road, of course. Uh, this was a company in need of a tornado, and I'm not sure if Don Sitios was prepared for the storm that is Karin. So please welcome Karin to the stage. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Actually, I would like to give the organizers a big round of applause for making such a great day so far. And one of the privileges uh, being a CEO is that you can choose the corporate color uh, and choose your favorite color, being orange. Uh, some of you have heard uh, my introduction many times. Elon wrote, we have nothing to do with Elon Musk. But the really bad dad joke is, Elon wrote, it's a Musk. But the Swedish word, as many of you know, for electricity is el. So we are what we called electricity on road. And the company was founded by Don, who's sitting over there. He, like me, he had a regular job, a normal job. He once walked the streets as a normal person, being a very, very successful film and TV director, writing scripts for Mia, Mia and Clara and uh, doing Julkalender and uh, Mysteriet på Greveholm and was a well respected person. But <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day all changed. Um, actually, it started really as a crazy idea. Uh, Don, he was working uh, in uh, television. Uh, the, the location is in Malmö. He lives in Lund, lives in an apartment. Um, very early you had an environmental uh, engagement and you switched into a battery electric vehicle, a Nissan Leaf. But at that time, 12, 14 years ago, I mean, the range was not so good. So a wintry day, you were driving to work with your jacket on because you couldn't have the heat, then the range would be too small. Uh, and there was like a small snow pile in the middle of the road, which remained um, un unaltered. And since you were a very creative person, your mind went like, what if there was something like that, that I could charge, you know, the slot car you see out there. What if there was something on the road that I can drive with, my, with heat on and I could have the small battery uh, and everything would be perfect. So you actually went home and you built the first prototype in Lego uh, to verify your assumptions. And, and then you reached out to Mats Allakulla. But Mats Alakula was a bit, uh, everyone who has tried to get hold of Mats Alakula knows that if you write him an email, it might take uh, some time before he responds. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that also because you get a lot of emails. Uh, but eventually you did have a connection uh, and discussion and you said, well, I th still think, because then the solution was... Uh, um, a bit above the ground, so it was a few centimeters sticking up. So if you convince me that this is a good solution, we'll go for it. So Dan, as the MacGyver kind of guy he is, he went to this wood shop and made a dummy rail from wood. You put it on the trailer, you went out to a racing course, and you had mats with you, you had a cup of coffee in the front, and you were filming what happened uh, when you changed and drive over it. But nothing happened. And then you said, let's go for this. And you started to develop this. Uh, and this was more than 10 years ago. And that is how it started. And the reason why we do this is purely climate driven. And we were a company that didn't have a technology. We had a climate engagement to be able to decrease CO2 from road transportation. And actually, a, a fun thing, and I think that some of you mentioned it on lunch, the really tipping point for Dan to quit his well-paid normal job to do this quest was 
Um, you were in, in Copenhagen for a weekend. You parked your car uh, in a garage and suddenly um, a lot of journalists started to call you. Uh, and it, apparently they found your car, not the journalist, but the police, because you had like a yog can of yogurt with some wiring and duct tape because you had started to rebuild this Nissan Leaf to be able to drive. And they thought it was a bomb. So they sealed the whole city center of Copenhagen and had a huge bomb squad. Uh, and in the end, you managed not to get your car demolitioned. You have to explain. And then you had to explain to journalists like Bloomberg, CNN. So this is not a bomb. I am not afraid of terrorists. I'm more afraid of the climate. And this is really what drives the company uh, to do this because it is a quest. And uh, it's, uh, it's like Christmas Eve today for, for us to sit here on this conference and listen to the results, verifying everything that we have been saying and thinking and believing. Because actually, it's not the technology that restricts us. It's the human behavior. I'm not sure um, when moving pictures started, they really started by filming live theaters. Because that is how we perceive and go about new technology. And uh, a few uh, months ago, I was at the um, uh, car uh, museum in Stuttgart with a Mercedes-Benz. And have you seen the first vehicle? It's a horse carriage uh, with a, a so, so to some extent, as humans, we take what we see now and we try to adopt it for the future. And for me, that is where we are at with the uh, battery electric vehicles. We have had vehicles and we've had a tank and we've gone somewhere to refill it. Uh, and now we realize, yeah, let's go battery electric. So we take out the tank and we put in a battery, but everything else looks the same. Uh, and it's not due to lack of technology, it's due to lack of our uh, human imagination and change of behavior. So for us, it's not only to develop the technology, it's really to make sure how do we get those 10,000 of kilometers uh, when we have a lot of strong forces that doesn't want this to happen because then we will cut off their revenue stream and they don't have the climate as their first. We were actually talking today uh, or the other day about restructuring or reforming our um, organization. Normally you have, you have the product in focus or you have the customer in focus, but we will have the climate in focus because that is really what drives us. And we truly believe that electrification can mitigate climate change. But it's very important that we don't create problems of tomorrow's today. And actually, that is why we don't want to have big batteries. Uh, or we cannot rely upon them alone. And I think we have gone through a lot today. But of course, it's, it's, uh, they will come better and so forth. But we do have the cost of scarce. I mean, I mean if we knew, and, and when Dan looked into this 10, 12 years ago, the discussion about the climate impact of producing batteries was quite high. We don't hear so much about that today, but still it has a climate impact of producing, even if they come better and cheaper. So we need to be very uh, efficient. And as you said, in Norway, Norway, you're doing electrification as fast as you can. But let's say we should do it as fast and resource efficient as we can. And then, okay, you have the weight uh, of batteries. I mean, it's a trade-off, batteries, payload, but also ripple effects of how do we affect tires? How does it affect the roads if the vehicles become heavier? And uh, that's an overall uh, uh, thing. Um, and also, if we get lighter vehicles, we might also be able to reduce the amount of energy that they need. So that is also a good effect. And space, we're talking about that, uh, and, and, and Matt and I was talking just before this conference, uh, you said uh, 1,100 chargers per uh, this charge station, approximately, and we were doing a very quick math. I'm so glad you were part, because I used to be a lawyer, I don't do math. Uh, I, I, I talked to the engineers. So we were just talking about how, how much area will be used for this. So if we just looked at the TNT corridor, it was the equivalent of 20,000 football fields. Uh, and then I asked actually ChatGPT, we do use AI sometimes also, uh, could you give me some kind of how do I put that in relation to something? Um, but it wasn't that big, but still the area of Gothenburg. So we should have the whole city of Gothenburg to be a parking spot for just charging cars. So should we really take more space or more land 
from nature for the benefit of vehicles when we can use roads as uh, a charging uh, equivalent. So for us, it's also about thinking uh, about that. And again, looking at this as a system shift. Of course, uh, destination charging and depot charging is a, a solution. Uh, but I know also that some uh, stakeholders in the Örebro region, where the first permanent electrical road is planned, they said they don't have the grid capacity to do overnight charging uh, alone. So uh, for me, uh, I try to introduce the very non-scientific um, expression, duttladning. So we should put out charging over the day and over the time. And I think a good expression would be ABC, always be charging. Uh, so we can keep the strain on the grid a bit lower. Because uh, if you have availability, again, it's the, th it's the notion of we had a tank, we ran it out, we refill it, and we're copying the same behavior. Keep it frequent, do frequent charging instead. And when we look into the future, Again, the change behavior. Uh, I just returned from Singapore. It was a lot of focus on both electrification and autonomous vehicles. Realizing that autonomous vehicles, it's not happening as fast as people thought uh, a few years ago. Mainly due to regulation and of course safety. But I would assume that within 5-10 years, we will definitely have uh, designated um, lanes or designated corridors for autonomous vehicles and when look into the port industry or confined areas that is already happening so the old notion of drive four and a half hour rest drive again it it will be irrelevant you if you're investing in a uh, asset like this you want to deploy it 24 7 and today when vehicles or electrical vehicles are two to three times uh, as expense, more expensive than a ICE car vehicle. Of course, you want to deploy it as much as possible. So again, getting charging where the vehicle spend a lot of time, either if it's standing still or moving, makes sense. And that's why we really, really believe that dynamic charging, either if it's ground-based or overhead, has its place in the value chain going forward. And uh, we can charge everything from long haul trucks to personal vehicles, uh, operational vehicles, and even discussing with uh, a French aircraft manufacturer, how can we make sure that you get energy on a taxi runway? So things that we didn't think were possible a few years ago will be possible due to technological advancement, but also our belief and yeah our belief in technology and change so dan i think that you didn't really expect this when you started this crazy idea and and a lot of people in the room including from the swedish transport administration have been looking into electrical roads for a long time but it could really happen and i truly believe that if we look at the facts and being logical about it, it really has its place. So I urge all of you to talk about this, post on social media and, and spread the knowledge of, of here today, because we can achieve a lot in a very short time. It, it showed with COVID. So if we have climate as our stakeholder focus, and do decisions based on what is best for climate, we could really make sure that electrical roads can happen n n shorter than 66 years, but within a decade to really be able to have this kind of uh, climate impact. So thank you so much for me. All right. Any questions from the audience? No? Crystal clear. I might have some questions. <laughs> All right. Which is the largest barriers? Which are the largest barriers? 
Well, I think there's uh, several, but of course, uh, one big uh, support would be if the OEMs could really see the benefit and collaborate, because we need to see this as a system shift. Uh, so, of course, getting and also uh, getting this uh, into the EU legislation. Right. Yeah. Here we go. Hi. So. Uh a large part of being a car owner, I think, and we haven't talked about it today, is the idea, the mentality of freedom. You can drive wherever you want to. I mean, because we have we talk about these e-roads, and when 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 people are going from a, from a traditional car to an EV car, they want the same kind of freedom. Yes. So that's I think a, a big portion of this is is the mentality around what's a car to you. It's a huge investment, right? And you want it to be the equivalent of the petrol car, the freedom of going where, where you want to. Um, are there any projects or, or something like that that you're into to, to kind of change our mindset about what the car is? Yeah. I mean, for car sharing, I, I find it's very viable and such, but representing uh, countries such as Norway, which is not too different from, from Sweden, because we're big in area, not too big population, we want to drive and roam around as we please, right? How do you do that change when it's not, when it's a very limited factor? Let's say we go for a, s much smaller batteries in the EVs. We rely on on electric roads. So, could you elaborate on that, please? Thank but you. actually, uh, for us, it's uh, normally as a e enabling electrification, keeping the freedom and flexibility. So, so that is the core, and it's not only in Sweden and Norway. I think also, like the US, must be like the car is your symbol of freedom and independence. Uh, but that's why we think electrical roads, of course, not when it's in its infant. I mean, when you're starting to build it out, but as a network, uh, then actually you will have infinite range, but with small battery and a small climate impact. So yes, uh, in the start, in the transition, that will not happen. But for me, that is not an argument to go for the long-term vision and start somewhere. So uh, of course, you should be able to drive from Malmö to Munich uh, and not have to stop unless you want to. Uh, and that is what electrical roads can achieve for you. All right. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker is Oliver Risse from Hamburg, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, He's the investment partner of the third largest port in Europe. The port of Hamburg. He's been working on both sides of the corporate venture. I hope I get this right. Uh, he has himself started six companies. Uh, and now he's on the other side. So he, now he's the investment partner. And this leads up to uh, he's been working with the startup business for 23 years. And the last 15 years been in Singapore. And now you're here to give your view on how ports can do with electrification. So please welcome, Oliver. Great. Thank you very much for having me here. To be very frank, um, this is awesome to see Karin speak here. That is why I personally love the startup space so much. We corporates are super slow, but the icebreakers, the really high pace vessels that are actually the startup companies, that I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm obviously representing a large corporate, but also um, understanding a bit what the startup business stands for. Yeah, I want to bring you today a couple of um, ideas about port operations, why ports are so important for the energy transition and tr on transportation, but also on energy. So on both sides, and obviously, we heard it this morning, um, there are the ports are a massive emitter um, on CO2, and we have to get rid of this. So um, I want to give you a couple of insights from our Hamburg port, where I'm coming from, um, but also a couple of visual, uh, visuals, how we are dealing with electrification in our, our ports. As you um, correctly said, um, Hamburg is the third largest port in Europe. It was for a 140 years old company was very, very stable and on top number one for many years. Then Rotterdam and Antwerp took over, but it's still a massive port operation um, that, we, that we see here. Typically, what you see on, on ports, you obviously have a key site where the vessels are, are getting in. You have tons of boxes everywhere around, and you have multimodal 
operations in terms of trucks, but also on trains, bringing import and export goods in and out to the port. Obviously, um, when you're coming to Hamburg or you're passing by by the Autobahn from Scandinavia to Germany, right? you're passing all the cranes, you see it everywhere, but typically you don't see an insight how the port, port operates um, um, efficiently. So in, in our operations, um, we, are we are moving around six and a half million TEUs, that means standard containers, that's what we are talking about this. Um, just in a comparison, I just checked out the Gothenburg port is around 900,000 um, TEUs per year, and which is the largest port in the Nordics, if I'm not mistaken. So just the Hamburg port alone, where we are operating, is around six, six, six and a half million standard containers that we're moving around. So it's all about heavy-duty transportation and heavy-duty trucking. That, of course, this also means um, a lot of emissions, as you can, can imagine. As I said, we are in Hamburg. We are having the largest hinterland terminal in the world. That means the con train connection all over to Europe. That is what you see on the left-hand side. So roughly 50% of all goods we are le leaving and reaching the Hamburg port by rail, which is in German conditions very different. We have an intermodal split of around 18% is rail, 82% is on, tr on, on roadside. So and the government has a very strong force to push this 18% to 25% increase in rail transportation in, by 2025. As you can imagine, building new rail tracks with German permissions is quite um, a long avenue to go. So that means it's all about um, um, efficiencies that what we are handling. But we're also using, um, obviously, a lot of ships and also a lot of um, trucks for any kind of transportation. To give you a sense what this means, so Hamburg, you see on the, on the top left, all the blue lines that are connecting, how we are connecting our own terminals together with other terminals within Europe. So um, this is sea terminals, but also cargo terminals. Um, but it also can have a sense how important it is to bring goods from A to B and from B to A. Um, intermodal, hopefully, because that saves the most um, emissions. So as I said, um, our business is all about heavy duty. It's all about containers moving boxes around. Those small little boxes is around um, 20 to 30 tons. This is just for the, for the steel structure. You can sense it's a lot of energy needed. If you take a look from, from the top of the crane where I was at, uh, last year, it's quite interesting to see how a port really operates, right? So this is a fully autonomous port, one of the three in, in Hamburg that we are operating. So you see everywhere movements. You see autonomous vehicles going around. You see the cranes all operating um, simultaneously. And on the left-hand side, you even see the trains going in and out. So the trains are left, block storage in the center, lots of movements around here autonomously. And on the right-hand side that you can't see here, that's where the vessel parks. Out of the four major container terminals in Hamburg, we are operating three. And that is, turns around six and a half million um, standard containers every year. And we are operating 24 7, um, obviously, um, tw uh, 24 7, 365 days um, a year. There's movement all the year round. But as you can imagine, this is all he heavy duty um, impacts. On those AGVs that you see over here, that was the first container, world, container terminal in the world 20 years ago where our engineers at site decided on a green field, how can we move goods around without human interaction? So this was probably one of the first automated um, gateways um, around, the, around the world. At that time, obviously run with diesel. Um, by last year, we changed our, our AGVs um, to electric vehicles um, that you can see over here. You see the size of those vehicles. You see the people standing on the right. This is man height wheels and tires going around, right? Moving really heavy goods around, which is massive um, from just from infrastructure's point of view. At this one terminal, we are operating around 100 vehicles, AGVs at the same time, permanently 24 seven. If those, car those, those little fellows here get, um, get charged or previously get filled in with diesel, <clears throat> it looked obviously very different. Nowadays, this is how it works now um, in, in reality. Those are fully automated electric char charging stations for AGVs, um, operating also in 24-7. So we're operating on one terminal, 17 of those 
um, automated um, charging stations if you want um, at the same time. And of course, you can use a lot of interaction and optimization between vehicles, deployment, and charging times. So what, what happens next on automation, right? This is our terminal in Tallinn, in Estonia, where we operate it not only on electric vehicles, but also on autonomous parts. We heard this before. Autonomy is a very big part of, of yard op optimization. And we used uh, to work with a startup company from Germany, who is the first company actually who tries to optimize traffic on yards in an autonomous way or in a semi-autonomous way, as you can see over here. So it's a very sim that's a situation actually directly seen um, at the yard um, um, in Tallinn in Estonia. And we are operating there in 24-7 operations too. So this is a simulation then here. What happens if the autonomous vehicle does not know what to do? It calls an, an teleoperation um, employee, a truck driver, and then this truck driver acts on, um, on behalf of the machine until the problem has been solved. And then, of course, pressing on a button and and the truck obviously goes by itself. With this, um, it sounds like it's a little bit of strange activity, maybe something in the future, but it's already acting right now. So we tried um, to optimize the yard in Tallinn, in Estonia, working on those teleoperated autonomous systems. Um, and this is also how we like, as Hala Next, the company I'm representing, how, how we like to work together with, uh, with startup companies. So trying new things out, even if you don't know the answer yet. So we heard it this morning as well. We cannot know all the answers before we even have started, right? So let's try and get things done. And that is what I always like to ask the audience in the room here as well. Try things out, try to get out, Try to speak with young companies like Karin's, for example, trying new things. Yes, yeah, sometimes you fail, but this is part of the startup's business, I believe. In, in, in our experience, how we are dealing with electrification and automation, this helps actually a lot. So we're not only optimizing the efficiency, of course, but it's also a question on safety. A yard, a heavy duty yard is obviously um, a dangerous place to be, and with the labor shortage that we have in trucking right now is going to be an even bigger problem in the future. So as Karin said before, there have to be other ways of transporting, transporting goods around than we have in our minds as of today. There is new areas, there are new areas, there will be new areas, and we have to find them all together. It's not that we know them here in, in, German, in Germany in our ports, but we can deploy our technologies in other ports too. And the interaction then between different ports, different experiences, different parties working on the same kind of technologies and deployment, we learn all together. And that knowledge now from Tallinn, the autonomous case um, I, I've shown here, that is actually an experience now we are transporting to our yards in, in Hamburg, but also transporting the same experience to our yards in Italy, where we're also operating sea terminals. So it's a learning curve at the end. But we have to do the first step. That is what I would like to encourage everybody of you. If you think about heavy duty transportation, yes, there is, a, there is an option to get rid of your emissions. And obviously, it needs the first step. And that is what I'm very proud of, that we are working together um, with um, young companies in, in our company, trying to invest into those, finding new ideas and trying to help companies to grow. Obviously, this is a, quite a, a weird image, right? Of course, you can never. Um, move a 20, 30 tons um, box with, um, you never know, maybe you do sometime in the future. But as of now, with current technologies, we can't. But it symbolizes pretty much how we see transportation. So you have to think outside the box. Even if you have 140 years of history, try new, looking forward, and try the best out of it. Right? And I'm very sure there's a lot of potential, particularly here for European companies, to really focus on the, on the local activities that we are doing here. So we on our side, um, um, on, on Hala Next, Hamburg Port um, Operations, um, we love to work together with startups globally. Um, have now a portfolio of around 40 companies, all looking into all kind of innovations in transportation of heavy, heavy duty goods, but also in decarbonization. So that's the invitation to you guys. If you know somebody, please get back to me, um, where we have to look into technologies to make change for the good of all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a question from Mikael Carlson. Yeah. 
Hello. So I'm curious about uh, the focus on transport. Is it also going from the key side to the vertical stack and then from the vertical stack out from the port? Or are you also working with the, with the port coming, uh, going out of the port? Yeah, it's a very good question. Of course, um, for us, it's not only the port side, it's the hinterland side as well. As I said, we are one of the largest train operators in Europe. Um, so we're looking a lot and we're getting a lot of business ideas right now from startups from the rail side right now, but also on the trucking side. So electrification of trucking is a very, very big opportunity. Probably the entire opportunity in energy transformation and, and tr uh, energy and transport transformation, this is probably the biggest investment opportunity in our times. So it's at two times at the same time. So yes, of course, we're looking into all modes of transportation, sea, road, rail, but also a little bit on aviation. Because you can imagine those kind of operation and maintenance of cranes. You can do this with labor, inspecting every year, so you do this with, with drones, right? So we have invested into two drone companies as well who are doing exactly those kind of activities. So I'm more interested in, in uh, truck transports in a way. So how, how big do you think the market on quite short hauls is around Hamburg? If you're uh, below 50 kilometers of range, for instance, how much of the outgoing goods is going shorter than 50 kilometers? So it's a super nice question because the it's a short haul business. So in ports particularly, right? So in our company alone, we are doing around 100,000 trips just before between one terminal to the other, 100,000 a year, right? So we're moving a lot around, right? All over Germany, so around 50% of all goods are going to be transported in an area not larger than 250 kilometers away. So if you make circles now around all those those infrastructure hubs where the major ports and terminals are, you cover a lot of market already on short haul um, range. So that's a massive opportunity for the trucking companies too. Thanks. Actually, I want to make a comment because it came from this, this, I think from you before. On logistics companies, they have one big question, right? They are planning to operate those assets for 10, 8, 10, 15 years. Vessels even 25 years. So if you make your planning, you have to be very clear what is the next to come, right? I want to give you an example. If you're seeing now the large vessels which are reaching Europe right now from Asia, they're having around 400 meters long, 60 meters wide, right? 24,000 standard containers on it, right? So now you buy a vessel, it costs you maybe 250 million euro, right? But how do you decide on a, which kind of drivetrain do you want to deploy? Is it going to be methanol? Is it ammonia? Is it going to be diesel? Is it, what is it? Is it battery electric? And you're operating those assets for 20 years. So to make those kind of decisions, it's a very, very difficult decision. And of course, you can say you want to be open for all kind of technologies in the future, but still, you have to take a decision today. So that sometimes in logistics companies, safety and planning is a very important factor to have. Um, and that is what we all have to take into account. So, um, the industry is, is ready to change, to adapt, but it's not in giant steps. It's small increment steps that's needed. Uh, yeah, one more question. You have uh, done the transition from diesel to uh, electric within the harbor, and, uh, but you still now have, did you say 17 like uh, charging stations uh, for those 100 vessels? Or, or, yeah. So there's an improvement possibility in efficiency maybe oh, absolutely yeah so there the you know starting from a transition from moving those those small little hvs that you saw right mm. this around 700 kilowatt hours battery power right mm. so which is 10 times the size than a regular car right and of course as a port operator you're not thinking in optimizing the charging for example or the state of charge how we call this you're saying a vehicle needs to be 100 percent ready all the time yes. so whenever there's a free slot you go in is that optimal? Mm. If you ask me, maybe not. Yeah. But there's room for improvement, absolutely. Yes. Charging on the way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? No? Thank you. Okay. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. Thank you so much.